All right, good evening, everyone. Man, so good to see you. We had a great time in the house of God this morning, and we're looking forward to another great time here this evening. Let's all stand, and let's turn to hymn number 490. Hymn number 490, Revive Us Again. Hymn number 490, let's sing it out this evening. We praise thee, O oh God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is gone up above. Hallelujah, thine glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine glory. Revive us again. Verse 2. We praise thee, O oh God, for the Spirit of life. Who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night? Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Verse 4. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from us. Good evening, everyone. Wasn't that a great time in church this morning and the messages we heard? And, and uh, so I, I hope you're going to tell us a little bit about uh, going to uh, Jordan. Jordan. Unless you did, and I just didn't know it. But anyway, good message this morning. Look forward. He's always a blessing when he comes here, and, and uh, we always respond so well. We, I think we have the biggest crowds of any speaker we have when Brother Swanky's here, and rightfully so. And, and I hope that you've already encouraged yourself to be here Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. If you're a Baptist, this is where you ought to be. Amen? If you're something else, I can't help you. But if you're a Baptist, you need to be here when the doors are open. Amen? Well, let's have a word of prayer and ask God's blessing. Father, we're thankful uh, tonight for your goodness, your blessing to us. And Lord, we're so privileged to be the kind of church that has the uh, men that we have that come and speak to us. Lord, we don't take that lightly. Uh, Lord, we know the Word of God will be honored and lifted up. And uh, Father, our hearts need to be in tune with the things of God. And the way, Lord, we come in, uh, in tune with you, the way we walk with you is knowing the Word of God and, Lord, applying it to our lives. So, Father, we pray your blessing once again upon Brother Swanky as he preaches tonight. Bless the choir as they sing any special music tonight. I pray, Lord, that in this place, all that is done may bring glory and honor to you. And we'll thank you for it. We ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Thank you very much, choir, for singing that wonderful song. I don't know about you, but I'm grateful for the cross. I'm grateful for Jesus taking my cross and dying in my place along the way. Thank you, choir, for singing that great song. We're going to sing a song about the cross, hymn number 55, At the Cross. So grab that hymn book. Let's stand and let's sing with the choir. At the cross, at last and did my Savior bleed. Hymn number 55. At last and did my Savior bleed. And did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Verse 2. Was it for crimes that I have done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing did it grace enough and love beyond decree. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight. All the day, verse four. But drops of grief can never repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Is all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith. I my sight, and now I am happy all the day. You may be seated. Man, I'm going to ask our rushers to make their way to the front at this time. We're going to take a moment and welcome those that are visiting with us. And I want to thank you so much for being here with us. And while they're making their way to the front, let me just draw your attention to a couple things that are in the bulletin there. First of all, don't forget uh, the, this week, uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday at 630, we'll be here uh, for our winter revival. Looking forward to hearing Brother Schwenke each of those nights. And then uh, at the end of this week on Saturday, we have our chili cook-off. And so if you've signed up for that, make sure um, you have... Uh, it says entries must be in by 5 p.m. for judging. And then uh, the, the glorious part, the eating, takes place at 6. So uh, <clears throat> I want to be here for that. If you haven't signed up yet and you plan on bringing something, go ahead and make sure you sign up in the foyer. Uh, 66 Books in 66 Days starts next Sunday. There are things in your bulletin now that would give you a pattern. You can read it the, the way that we've always uh, done it in the past. We've outlined a new way chronologically. You can do so. There are also reading plans for the New Testament and or the Old Testament in your bulletin. So uh, uh, please make sure you take advantage of that. It would be a wonderful thing in, in really just um, two and a half months from now to be able to say, I've just read through the entire Bible. Uh, that's a, that'd, be a, that'd be a wonderful thing. And, and the, the, one of the positives about 66 books in 66 days, not only are you reading God's word, but you, you kind of get, get a macro look of, uh, of what uh, Scripture is doing. And, and so I want to encourage you to, to participate in that. And then I also want to say this. Uh, don't stop reading after 66 days. Continue to read your Bible every day. That's a positive thing to do, all right? If this is your first time here or your first time in several months, we want to take a moment and just thank you so much for being with us. And our ushers have a pen and a card for you. So if you'd be so kind as to raise your hand, high enough for these guys to see it, they're going to make their way toward the back. They'll hand you a pen. They'll hand you a card. The pen is your to, yours to keep. But if you just take a moment and fill that card out, drop it in the offering plate when it's passed by, we would certainly appreciate having a record of your a visit with us. We want you to know this. You're not just a visitor here. You are an honored guest. And we're so thankful that you took time to come and uh, be with us tonight. If uh, you stop by the bookstore on your way out tonight, there's a, there's a gift for you at the bookstore. So uh, please make sure you do that. And thank you so much. We trust that the service will be a tremendous blessing to you this evening. Let's stand together and grab our hymnals once again, Brother Adam is going to come and lead us in another song. <clears throat> Hymn number 60, The Way of the Cross Leads Home. We'll sing a verse in the chorus to shake some hands. Hymn number 60, The Way of the Cross Leads Home. I must needs go home by the way of the cross. There's no other way but this. I'm on the side of the gates of life. If the way of Let's 
go around. Let's make everyone feel especially welcome this wonderful evening. Verse 3 of this wonderful hymn. Then I bid farewell to the way of the world, to walk in it nevermore. For my Lord says, come and I seek my home, heaven hangs at the open door. The way of the cross leads home, the way of the cross leads home, it is sweet to Number 53, it's not a song that we sing often, but it's a great song. Hymn number 53, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Here we go. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died. Verse 
for amazing, so divine, demands my life, my soul, my all. You know, only the, only the love of God would provide salvation for people like us who are so undeserving, and he certainly deserves our faithfulness to him, doesn't he? What a wonderful song. Thank you so much for that wonderful singing tonight. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward at this time as we prepare for the evening offering. If you're here tonight and you're a special guest with us, I want to remind you, if you uh, if you've already been able to fill it out, <clears throat> to drop the card in the offering plate. If you haven't finished filling it out, that's okay. You can hand it in at the bookstore after the service when you stop by to pick up your gift. But uh, we do want to thank you so much for being here. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've got something that's just landed in my throat. <clears> throat> um, please don't feel obligated if you're visiting with us to be a part of this, uh, be, do a part of this uh, part of the service, but uh, um, our, our regular tenders and our members, we uh, look forward to the opportunity to be a part of uh, or give, taking our tithes and offerings, and so, um, but please, if you're visiting with, don't feel obligated to it. Let's have a word of prayer. Ask the Lord to bless our offering this evening. Our Father, we are thankful for your goodness to us and for your love for us, and Lord, we are thankful again for the opportunity to be a part of the offering tonight. And Lord, as we give, I pray that you would, uh, as you always do, take what we give and bless it and break it and multiply it. And Lord, I pray that you'd help it to be stewarded wisely, help it to be used to get the gospel around the world. I pray it should be with the preaching of your word. Lord, may it uh, dig down deep into our hearts, into our lives, and I pray that we would make the changes that are necessary that your spirit prompts us to make. We love you. We thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Those sins were mine. 
I simply breathed the name of Jesus and said, I'll tell you one more time. I plead the blood on my behalf. I plead the blood on all my past. I knew I was guilty as I stood before the judge. He questioned me. Thank you so much. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. What a great plea that is. The blood of Jesus, nothing else, nothing more, just the blood of Christ. Let me invite you to open your Bible tonight to Psalm 12, the 12th Psalm. And I'd like to begin reading in Psalm 12 and verse number 1. What a great day to be at Harvest Baptist Temple. My, uh, I thank you so much for the music today, the choir this morning, tonight, the special today and tonight. Uh, honoring and exalting the Lord Jesus Christ. And when the music is done, Brother Addison, if Jesus is exalted, that's, that's a good day. That's a good day. And there, there's nothing else. We, we don't need to exalt performers. Performance says, but we do need to magnify our Savior, the Lord Jesus. And all day long today, uh, the music is exalted and magnified Christ. What a wonderful, wonderful thing. Thank you so much for your efforts for the Lord. God's been so good to us. I've had the privilege the last year to spend a number of weeks preaching with missionaries around the world. And, and uh, as the preacher mentioned this morning, there's a table set up out front with some preaching on it. And uh, there'll be some more tomorrow. The box got lost. It'll be here tomorrow. But the books and preaching. And, and we use all that material to go spend time with missionaries like Brother Keck around the world. And, and uh, it's just a great joy and a great privilege to open up the Bible and to preach. And Brother Keck's a great interpreter. I don't know if you know that or not. If you ever had a chance to see that. But he he gets going. He gets the job done. It's, in fact, um, I don't even know if he interprets what I say. I think he's just preaching his own message. I have no idea. How do I know? I just get in and I get out, wash my hands, and that's the end of it. So, but it's just a great privilege to spend some time in churches that are just like Harvest Baptist Temple. Might look a little different, might not be so beautiful an auditorium, but, but as people that love our Lord, they have the same set of convictions we do. And, and I spend time every year, and, and I take those trips using the monies from the table in the back. So the books and the preaching, I trust it will be an encouragement for you. Everything back there I make with churches like Harvest Baptist Temple in mind. And uh, if you do the ebook thing, those books are available at Amazon as well. So I encourage you to stop by, and that's the commercial for the week. But uh, thank you so much for your prayers and your help, and you're such an encouragement to me. How thankful I am for your pastor. How thankful I am for Harvest Baptist Temple. Now, you have your Bible to Psalm 12, and, and when we open our Bible to Psalm 12, it's, it's a little bit unique because we don't precisely know the story in David's life where the psalm fits in. 
Of the 150 Psalms, somewhere between 73 to 87, God gave the words to David and David wrote them down. Now of those, we'll say 75, give or take a few, 14 of the Psalms, we know precisely where it happens because before you get to verse number one, there's a title that tells us. There's no such title in Psalm 12. You know, there's other Psalms, though the Bible doesn't specifically say, you begin to read and you can pretty much take a, a good guess, maybe even an accurate guess as to the story in David's life. But you know, it doesn't work like that in Psalm 12. In fact, as you read Psalm 12, you might look at it and say, there's certainly a lot of places in David's life where this Psalm would work. I perhaps this was a Psalm in one of those many days when King Saul had an eye on David. I mean, with the javelin flying right past David's ear, or when Saul comes after him and David's on the run, certainly Psalm 12 would fit in any single one of those occasions. Well, there were many a night where David slept in a lonely cave, wondering if he was going to see the sun rise the next morning. Certainly Psalm 12 would fit into any one of those moments. Perhaps it was the day when David literally literally rescued the city of Keilah from the hand of the enemy. And then the very men of Keilah wanted to turn around and, and deliver David to the full. Or perhaps the day when his own brothers did the same thing. David knew what backstabbing was all about. I Perhaps Psalm 12 fits in that moment when, when Doe came to spy on him and he went back to Saul with a report. Psalm 12 would work when David was running for his life from his own son Absalom. And you know, that maybe is the point, isn't it? Because Psalm 12 is one of those Psalms that, and it doesn't just fit one spot in David's life, nor does it fit one spot in your life or mine. It's one of those places where we need to run to again and again and again. I, we think we've got the victory and we think we won the battle and, and maybe that's so, but for every battle we win today, there's another one to fight tomorrow. So Psalm 12, perhaps we don't know where it fits for a good reason. Maybe it's God's way of reminding you and reminding reminding me that again and again and again we need to run to this psalm because for whatever the story is in David's life, there is one thing we need to know in Psalm 12. David is facing an emergency. If you're able physically, could I invite you to stand together with me as we go to Psalm 12 and verse number 1. The Bible says, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. David is facing a crisis, and he needs God's help right now. <laughs> Father in heaven, as we open the Bible tonight, would you please help us? May we put away the distractions of the day and the burdens of this old pagan world. And I pray that tonight you would instruct us and teach us in the way we should go, that you would guide us with thine eye. If someone in this room has never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what a glorious thing if they left this building tonight with salvation according to thy word. For your children, may the word of God do great work. May it break up the fallow ground of our lives. Oh, Father, how we ask you to do a mighty work of revival. In the great name of Jesus, my Savior, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Please be seated. In verse number one, there's a crisis in David's life. He looks up to heaven and the words say, Lord, I need your help and I need your help right now. The Bible tells us humans have failed David and be it the godly man who's in the singular, be it the faithful men, David's friends that are in the plural, David wasn't going to be rescued by them right now. No, David is facing a crisis in his life and the only one that can deliver him is his God. So the Bible tells us in a moment of panic, David looks up and says, help Lord. Would you notice in verse number one, the name of the Lord is completely capitalized. David is not saying, I need the mighty God of creation to help me now. David is not saying, I need the mighty King of glory to save me now. No, for all the character of God and all the characteristics of God, David says, I need my Savior. I need Jehovah. I need the one who is my personal Lord. David says, Lord, there's a crisis in in my life and right here and right now I need some help and if you don't deliver me now tomorrow's going to be too late or right here and right now I need you to help me I need you to deliver me what could it possibly be 
I mean, we listen to David cry out in a moment of panic, and, and maybe we picture David behind a rock, and some old Philistine garrison is coming after him. I Perhaps David is looking at a giant nine and a half to twelve and a half feet tall, and they Goliath, and David's knees are knocking together, and, and David says, Lord, I need you to deliver me right now. I Perhaps David is looking out the mouth of a cave, and, and Saul has come by the hundreds with his soldiers, the greatest sharpshooters in the world. Every one of them are ready to pull back the arrow on a string and drive that arrow right through the heart of David. Whatever the occasion may be, you and I would read verse number one and say, David's facing an emergency. This is a crisis. And it's what makes Psalm 12 all the more powerful. Because if we stopped at verse number one, our minds would picture a, a soldier coming after David with a mighty sword. We would picture Psalms 1, David on the battlefield, his multitudes are coming against him, and there's nowhere to go and nowhere to hide. We would read verse 1 and see a giant nine and a half to twelve and a half feet tall, or we would see the greatest sharp, sharpshooters in the world ready to take David on as a target. But the enemy of Psalm 12 is a whole lot more powerful than some Goliath. In verse 1, it's an emergency. David says, Lord, I need you to help me right now. So what could possibly be coming after David? And in verse number 2, the Bible answers. The Bible tells us who David's foe is. Not a soldier, not a Goliath, not some army. But the Bible says they speak vanity, every one with his neighbor. Everything about verse 1 is David saying there's a crisis, and I can't take it, and I need some help, and I need help right now. Lord, I need you to rescue me, and I need you to do it stunningly right here. And then we get to verse number two, and we realize the enemy coming after David is somebody in their tongue. You know, sometimes I start reading the Bible, and Psalm 12 works like this. I, you almost start laughing a little bit, saying, like, did the Lord write this last night? You know, sometimes we think that all the problems we've got in the culture that we live in and, and the pagan world that is ours, it's never been like this. And, and that's why I love to go to a psalm like this and take good comfort because we're not the first ones that have to deal with this stuff. And so now in verse number one, there's David pulling his hair out. There's David beating his head against the wall. David's saying, I need you to help me and help me right now. What could possibly be the enemy? And notice how he describes this in verse two. They speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor. So David says, Lord, I just can't take it anymore. You know, we can imagine him perhaps sitting on the throne and he looks up and says, Lord, everywhere in this kingdom, there are people that are going to the backyard fence. And, and you know, modern Bibles get this verse all wrong. They have it right in, written in verse number two. They speak lies. But lies and vanity are two different things. Now, certainly vain words could be lying words, but they don't have to. The word vain doesn't mean they're lying about me. It means they're saying frivolous and empty and useless things about me. So in verse two, David is looking to heaven and saying, Lord, I need help right now. Because all around this kingdom, there are people over the backyard fence that are gossiping about me and they're stabbing me in the back. And and it's not like they're standing here in the palace. It's not that I can look him in the eyeballs. It's not like we can go one-on-one. -on -one. Oh, no, David says it's the enemy I don't see. It's the enemy that stabs me in the back. It's the enemy that's gossiping and griping about me. It's the enemy that's talking me down and I can't defend myself. What do you know? It looks like in David's day they had their own special version of Facebook. <laughs> Who would have guessed? Who would have guessed they had Twitter accounts back then? Oh, long before Vice President Gore invented the internet, don't you worry, Satan had plenty of ways to get gossip across the land. And you know, long before anybody ever had a keyboard and long before anybody ever had a smartphone, oh well, back then it may have taken just a little bit longer, it was neighbors over the backyard fence speaking to their neighbors vain things. But you know, this isn't the first generation that had the Twitter generation and the Instagram generation and the Facebook generation. Oh, David had the same battle. And he looks up to heaven and he says, Lord, I just can't take this anymore. They're stabbing me in the back and I can't defend myself. If that weren't enough, notice in verse 2, the Bible says there were others who speak with flattering lips. Well, certainly a king like David would know flattering lips. David is surrounded in the palace by people he can't trust, by people that are constantly 
simply telling him what he wants to hear, not what he needs to hear. And a man like David, a man's man, can't handle flattery. I know our world loves flattery. Our world loves to build up egos. I know we live in a day where parents can't tell their children the truth. They have to flatter them and build them up. I get it. That's how our society lives. But you know, David had to face the same thing. And you watch him look up in Psalm 12 and say, Lord, I need help right now because if it's not people over the backyard fence that are stabbing me in the back and I am surrounded by fraudulence and phoniness and why people are just saying things they don't believe and they're just saying words of flattery to I, David's a man's man. He said, I can't stomach it anymore. Help me. If that weren't enough... On the other side, David said, there's others who speak with a double heart. The language of the Bible is a heart and a heart. In America, we call it speaking with a forked tongue. At least that's what the Indians used to say. I mean, somebody says one thing out of this side of their mouth, and somebody says another thing out of the other side of their mouth. And somebody like King David certainly had to deal every day with politicians. And so David looks up to heaven. He says, I just can't take this. If it's not the Facebook and the Twitter accounts, and over here, these flatterers, will tell me what they think I want to hear. And if it's not that, everywhere I turn around in this silly palace, there's these politicians and you can't trust a word they say. you got to have a dictionary in your hand every time they speak. you got to parse every verb. I mean, you just got to pick apart it because there's a double meaning to everything. I mean, David was living in his version of Washington, D.C., where you just can't believe a word you hear. I, people say one thing and there's just this gray area. There's this, this little shade of meaning. And David it says, just give me a man, whether I like it or not, that'll say something to my face. David says, Lord, they're stabbing me in the back on Facebook. David says, Lord, I just can't take it. These flatterers are so phony. He says, I just can't take this Washington politician crowd anymore. I just can't handle the double talk. I have just had it up to here with the whole thing. If that weren't enough, how about verse number four? You understand? There's a reason. I mean, it's like the Lord wrote this last night. He said, there are others who say, with our tongue, we will prevail. So it's not with our ideas we will prevail. It's not with our knowledge we will prevail. Oh, no. Oh, no. David says, Lord, I can't take it anymore. Because there are people who are convinced that if they talk louder than anybody, and if they talk longer than anybody, then they're the ones who win the day. Well, what do you know? It would appear they had their version of news media back then, too. I mean, David's looking around and says, I can't take the Facebook stuff. I just can't take these flatterers. I just can't take these stupid politicians. And if that weren't enough, David says, I just can't take the media. I mean, their mouths are moving 100 miles an hour. I mean, they're just waiting for somebody to stop and take a breath so they can interrupt. And David says, all they do is just talk. I mean, they just talk and they just talk. And it's hour after hour after hour. And all they do is say the same old thing. I mean, to tell you, David says, I just can't take the media anymore. And whatever it was his version of Fox News, his version of CNN, his version of NBC, but whatever it might have been, David says, I just can't take this anymore. Talk, 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 and it gets louder and it gets longer, and it's given me this massive headache, and Excedrin won't fix it anymore. David can't take the talk. Well, how about that? If that were enough, how about the end of verse number four? If it wasn't the Facebook, Instagram slash crowd, if it wasn't the flattery crowd or the politician double talker crowd, if it wasn't the news media talking longer and louder, David said there are these other people who say our lips are our own who is Lord over us. My mouth belongs to me and nobody's going to tell me what to say. I'll say what I want, where I want, when I want. I believe we have a phrase for this in the modern vernacular. I do believe we call that trash talk. I mean, you can't even walk into McDonald's in the morning, get a cup of coffee, but some old guys are sitting over there cussing them 100 miles an hour. You know, in the old days, it used to be some dirty old guy that was cussing all the time. Forget that. Now it's mothers that are cussing all the time. They're real men, aren't they? Man, they learn how to cuss like a sailor. And I mean, everywhere you go, the language is so dirty. The language is so coarse. I people blaspheme the name of God. I people use dirty, filthy language. They are so profane. And they're saying exactly what verse 4 says. Nobody's going to tell me what to say. Nobody's going to tell me worse what not to say. I'll say what I want. My mouth belongs to me. Trash talkers. I mean, you, you can't score a touchdown in a football game and somebody thinks they have to laugh at their enemy. Yeah. 
You can't score two points in a basketball game. But somebody thinks, now i got to let everybody in the world know how great I am and how useless my opponent is. I mean, what is that? And David says, everywhere I look, I just can't take it. My head is about ready to explode. He said, Lord, I don't need help tomorrow. I don't need help next week. I need some help right now. David says, if it's not people stabbing me in the back on Facebook. And David says, there's these politicians. You can't trust a word they say. If it's not the politicians, it's the flattery crowd. They're going to tell you whatever they think you want to hear. If it's not that, the news media gets longer and they get louder and they never stop. And if it's not that, David says, everywhere I go, there's people with their cursed, dirty, vile language. Poor old David says, I need help, and I need help right now. Now, you'll notice David knows one day the Lord's going to take care of this. In verse number 5, he said, The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things. He knows in verse number 6 that for the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord, I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. And David says, Now I know one day the Lord's going to take care of this. I know that one day the Lord is going to deal with those phony politicians, that the Lord is going to deal with those dirty talkers, that the Lord is going to deal with the vain people and the liars. David says, I know that that one day the Lord is going to deal in judgment. But David said, one day is too late for me. I don't need help one day. I need help right now. I got to tell you, I read Psalm 12 and I say, oh, that works. Because just like David in Psalm 12, we live in a day where neighbors speak vanity. Maybe not over the backyard fence as much as they do with a keyboard. We live in an hour where you can't trust a word it seems like people say. I mean, we have a whole generation of people that are living in America that, you know what, they're so used to lying. They just lie all the time. They just lie so casually. You know, in pagan countries, they really don't even have a problem with lying. I mean, in pagan countries, you can lie. The only bad thing is if you you get caught in your lie. That's where the disgrace is. But you know, in so much of the world where God's never been considered and the Bible's never been used, lying is an accepted thing. And that's how pagan we are in America. You know how pagan we are? People so casually lie that you can't believe a word they say unless they use the word super. I'm super excited. I am super happy. I ran super fast. And unless they're putting an adjective on it, and usually it's the word super, I just can't stand that, but usually it's the word super. And if they don't use the word super happy, super quick, super big, super small, if they don't use the word super, then you pretty much have to assume that what they said was a lie. Because when they use the word super, then they're saying, no, no, I'm really telling you the truth this time. That's pretty much how pagan we become. You can't trust a word that people say. I mean, people in business, they'll just lie so casually. People in America lie all the time, and they don't see anything wrong with it. And David says, I can't take it. I just can't take it. I just can't take the news media. All they do is just, I mean, do you ever just take the remote control and hit the mute button? It's a beautiful thing, the mute button. Yeah. You just watch the mouths of these people. How does a mouth move that fast? It's just going a thousand miles an hour. I mean, here's somebody, really, really, you graduated last May from the University of Oregon, and, and now you have so much knowledge, you're going to impress the rest of the world. You know everything about the Middle East. You know everything about everything. And the mouth moves a hundred miles an hour. And if I talk longer than you, and if I talk louder than you, everything's a big debate. And David just says, I can't take it anymore. I mean, David says, I'm tired of the trash talk. I'm tired of the news media. I'm tired of the politics. Politicians. He says, I'm just tired of the whole thing. And we watch David in Psalm 12 look up to heaven and say, Lord, this is worse than Goliath. Lord, this is worse than King Saul. I need you to help me. And I don't need you to help me on judgment day. I need you to help me right now. So you know what the Lord does? He helps David right now. You say, preacher, i got to tell you, I just can't take the words of this world anymore. And I, I, I got the idea, I'm not the only one, that if I never hear the word Twitter again, I'd be a happy guy. 
I can't be the only one that says, I really don't care what the latest, hottest post is on Facebook. Don't even care. I, I can't be the only one that says, you know, I'm just so tired of people waking up in the morning like they're on drugs. And there's too many Christians like this. They're shaking in the morning. Oh, no, no, they don't need a cup of coffee. What they need in the morning is their remote control so they can put on Fox News or some other news channel. And they sit there for three hours in the morning. It's the same news story told again. You do realize... You do realize that these news channels make money when you're afraid. Do you, you realize that? I mean, that's why there has to be a banner. Breaking news. Oh, no, what happened? You know, they're never going to say breaking news. The plane landed safely at Med Medford Regional Airport. Somehow that's never the breaking news. Oh, no, these people make money when you're afraid. So the way they make money is getting you afraid, so you have to watch them. And here's somebody three hours in the morning, and, and now their mind is ready to explode, but they, all they've heard is the same story hour after hour after hour. Then and when that's done, they flip on the radio, and they listen to this talk show for three hours. Then they listen to that talk show for three hours, and they listen to that talk show for three hours. They actually take a break from like 6 to 7 o'clock at night for dinner, and then the TV goes back on, and it's three more hours of the same thing. And I don't care who somebody is. I don't care how much Bible they've learned. I don't care how much they're long they've been saved. Anybody who sits in front of a TV or listens to a radio for 10 hours a day and listening to people who make their money when you panic, they're going to be people with all kinds of problems. And people say, I'm so tired of this. I'm tired of the media. I am tired of politicians. I, I'm just so tired of them all. And I don't know about you, but I've really had it up to here in the last few weeks. Just tired of Washington. You're tired of uh, Salem. I'm so tired of politicians. I'm so tired of the news media. I'm just so sick and tired of the whole thing. And here is David in Psalm 12 looking up to heaven and saying, Lord, I can't take this anymore. I have had it up to here. They have beat me down to the place where I'd rather be on the battlefield facing Goliath. Lord, this is a crisis in my life and I don't need help one day I need you to deliver me right now and the Lord does so what's the answer to all the Facebook slash Instagram slash whatever's next out there what is the answer for the child of God tonight, for all the phony flatterers, for all of the talk in Washington and Salem? What is the answer tonight to CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News? What is the answer tonight for all the talk on the radio? What is the answer tonight for all the trash talk that just corrupts this world? You will find that answer in verse number 6. Where the Bible simply says, the words of the Lord are pure words. Right there, that sound you hear, that would be David starting to breathe again. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. All of a sudden, David starts to breathe because when you leave Psalm 12 in the psalm, all of a sudden, a very powerful story comes forward. You know, as independent Baptists, we love Psalm 12, 6, and 7. Man, we love that. We can't quote that enough, preach that enough. But, you know, the problem is that sometimes we're such a hurry to get to verse number 6 that we forget get verses 1 to 5. And in the light of a world that was full of talk, 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 in verse number 6, we watch David say, you know, I just slip into my office, shut the door, I scroll out the Bible, and all of a sudden I find an answer to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I find an answer to flattery, to phoniness, to politicians. I've got the antidote for CNN and Fox News. I've got the answer for all the dirty trash talkers. And David just, well, for him, scrolls out his Bible and he says, just give me the Word of God. Just give me the Bible. You say, what's the answer for all the talk in this world? It is a child of God at Harvest Baptist Temple who wakes up on a Monday morning and says, before I go to school, before I go to work, before the day begins, before I turn on the news, before I do anything else, all right, maybe you need a cup of coffee, but before I do anything except for that, just give me a comfortable chair, just give me a quiet spot, just give me an open Bible and let the Lord speak to me. And you know, if we'd spend more time in the Bible than we do on Fox News, 
things would change. If we spent more time listening to the Bible than we do to Rush Limbaugh, we might actually see revival in the land. If we would spend more time reading the words of God than reading Facebook uh, posts, it just might be God could get our attention and he could change some things in our life. No, if we just spent more time worried about what God says than we're worried about what Nancy Pelosi says, then, you know, we just might find ourselves having some peace. We just might find ourselves right where God wants us to be. The answer to the world's talk is the Word of God. Why? Well, you know the verses. There's seven lessons the Bible gives us about the Word of God. All you need is one, and you could pick any one. But David doesn't give one. He said, let me tell you why the Bible changes everything. Let me tell you why when the world is swirling with their language and words, I run to the Bible. First, he said, and I know this is going to sound a little strange, but the English teacher will back me up on this. Hear me carefully. Number one, the Bible is God's words. I know it sounds a little funny. The Bible is God's words. He said, what do you mean? Well, look at verse number six. It doesn't start out with the idea of God. It doesn't say the philosophy of God, and it doesn't even say the word of God. The Bible says the words of the Lord. And we are reminded yet one more time, all told in the Bible some 3,200 times Old and New Testament, we are reminded that the Bible is not a collection of God's thoughts. The Bible is not a collection of God's wisdom. Every single one of the words in the Bible, they are the very words of God. Of Almighty God. You see, the liberal cemetery, a, a, a seminary professor comes along tonight and says, now, Pastor Reed, there's really not much of a difference between what you believe and, and what we believe in our seminary class. Why, we all believe that the Bible contains the Word of God. My friend, that's not going to get it done. You see, the liberal church member will believe, yes, the words of God are found in the Bible. The Bible contains the Word of God, the wisdom of God, the philosophy of God. But that's not what the Bible claims for itself. In verse number 6, the Word of God tells us that every single one of the words in the Bible are the very words of God. That's why we don't have the right to pick and choose what counts. That's why we don't have the right to eliminate things in the Bible. That's why we don't have the right to paraphrase the Bible. And you say, well, you know, we're kind of living in a dumbed-down society. You know, in a dumbed-down society, about the very last thing we need is a dumbed-down Bible. <laughs> and that's why we don't have the right to change. You say, well, then if people don't understand the words in the Bible, what do we do? Well, it's what's called preaching. Yeah. It's why you explain those things. We don't have the right to pick and choose. We don't have the right to change because the Bible is not just God's ideas. It's not God's philosophy. It's not God's thinking. It is not that somewhere in the Bible there is the Word of God. And if you find the right professor with the right degree from the right school, he will explain to you what it is. Oh, no. No, when you wake up tomorrow morning and you find your quiet spot and you open up your Bible, it doesn't matter if you're reading in Revelation. It doesn't matter if you're in Genesis 1. It doesn't matter where you are. You are reading the words of God. Every single one of the words of the Bible, they are the words of God. It's why the Bible's the answer to all the talk in the world. Because for all the talk of the politicians and all the talk of the common man, for all the talk of the news media, for all the talk of this old pagan world, when I open up my Bible, these are the very words of Almighty God. The Bible is God's words. But notice David also realizes, number two, that the Bible belongs to God. I, I love verse number six, the words of the Lord. Excuse me, it does not say the words of the American Bible Society. It doesn't say these are the words that are owned by some seminary. No, these words do not belong to a school. They do not belong to an organization. These are the words that belong to Almighty God. And that's why you better be awfully careful with these new modern Bibles that come down the pike. You know, whenever they come out, the first thing I like to do is go to the title page. And you know what you're going to find? You're going to find these modern versions that come out day after day. They are copyrighted, and they, as copyrights are owned by some organization. Sometimes they go so far as to say this. If you're going to use this Bible, you need our permission to do it. Excuse me, folks. 
I don't need the permission of any foundation. I don't need the permission of any organization. I don't need the permission of any seminary to open up God's words and study God's words and quote God's words and use God's words because the Bible does not belong to them. The Bible belongs to God. And when somebody says, I have written a Bible and you need my permission to use the Bible, I got to tell you, I'd hate to be such a person on Judgment Day. This book doesn't belong to them. It belongs to God. Number one, the Bible is God's words. Number two, the Bible belongs to God. But notice in verse number six, number three, the words of the Lord are pure words. These words are so clean. These words are so genuine. How pure is the Bible? Look what it says. Purified seven times. In David's day, if you put something through the fire once, you know, it was considered to be kind of coarse. But if you put gold or silver jewelry through the fire a, a second time, a third time, every time it go through the fire, more of the impurities would be taken away. But when it comes to the Bible, do you see what it says? The Word of God has been purified seven times. That's just not a perfect number. In David's day, the thinking was, if you put gold or silver through the fire seven times, it was absolutely pure, 100% pure. It would be impossible to be any more pure than going through the furnace seven times. And David says the Word of God's been through the fire seven times. In other words, there's no error in the Bible. There there are no mistakes in the Bible. I will freely admit there are things in the Bible I don't understand. That's not God's problem. That's my problem. But understand there are no errors in this book. There's no corruption in this book. We don't need the latest thing, the latest idea. We don't need the latest preacher to explain what it really means. We don't need some seminary professor to tell us what God didn't say but what he meant to say. And had he advised with me, he would have known what to say. Oh no. oh, no. This book is so completely pure, there's no error, no fault in the Word of God. You understand why this works? And David's beating his head against the wall. I just can't take these words anymore. Lord, I just can't take it anymore. I'm tired of the politicians. I'm tired of the news media. I'm tired of the trash talk. I'm just so tired of all of this. So he runs to his Bible and he says, when I open that Bible, I start breathing. He said, this book is God's words. This book belongs to God. This book is pure. No Number four, the book is precious. How precious, David? David said it's precious as silver. If that weren't enough, a few psalms later in Psalm 1910, he said they're more to be desired than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Psalm 119, 72, the law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. And David could say in Psalm 119, I love thy commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. David said it's not only absolutely pure, David says, when I open up this book, it is more precious than gold, more precious than silver. An old English preacher had a lady in his church, had been a long time member, and, and she was up there in years now. And, and over the years, this pastor had preached for many, many years in the church. He, he oftentimes would go and visit that lady in her home. And, and, and he noticed that in the early days, he'd visit this elderly lady. And, and uh, she had a big old German Bible, and she was a German lady. And, and there were big, big margins in that Bible. And, and the preacher loved to pick up that Bible and thumb through it. And, and he noticed this, old, this lady would write the word precious. She would read something in the Bible, it'd speak to her heart, and she'd take her pen, and, and right there in the margin, she'd write precious. And, and the old English pastor said, when I'd pick up that Bible, I'd thumb through the pages, precious, precious, precious. But he noticed as the years went by, this sweet old lady, she stopped writing the word precious in her Bible. It was just one of those things that dawned on the preacher. And, and you know, for his monthly or bi-monthly visit, whatever that was, he, he went to see the lady, and, and now she was well, way up there in years. And, and the preacher commented, he said, you know, he said, I, I remember in days gone by, every time I'd pick up your Bible, you write the word precious, but you don't do that anymore. So the pastor said, why is this? And that German lady smiled at her pastor and said, well, you know, pastor, I've come to the place where I don't need to write the word precious because everything I read is precious. Exactly. More than silver, more than gold. I, this world's going to wake up tomorrow. It's going to beat its head against the wall. I need more money. I need more stuff. I need more toys. I need more treasures. I need more, just bigger and better. I'll never be satisfied until I have more than somebody else. And the world lives in its rat race thinking they can get more precious things. But the child of God wakes up tomorrow and says, you know, keep the TV off, keep the radio off, uh, keep the computer closed. Just give me a Bible because when I open up the pure, precious words of God. 
all of a sudden I'm reading something that counts for eternity. David said, in the midst of the swirling words of this kingdom, I just go to my Bible. The Bible is God's words. The Bible belongs to God. The Bible is pure. The Bible is precious. But how about this? He said, the Bible is tested. How tested? Well, it's like silver tried in a furnace of earth. A furnace of earth. In Bible times, there were different sized furnaces. But when it speaks of a furnace of earth, that was the most massive. It was the largest furnace. Why, a jeweler might take a piece of jewelry and put it through a, a small tabletop furnace, so to speak. And, and it might do the job for some cheap custom, custom jewelry. But when it comes to the Word of God, David says, Oh no, the Word of God has gone through the hottest coals. The Word of God has gone through the greatest fires. It was a furnace of earth that they threw those three boys in in the book of Daniel and David says my book has been tested tested by the hottest coals of hell tested by the fires of Satan itself and the truth is you and I stand here 2,000 years after Christ and we hold in our hands the completed word of God and in human history there has been no book that has been assaulted like the Bible has you talk about a book going through the fire. Think about it tonight. We can just go back for 100 years of world history. Forget the 1900 before that. But from the very moment that God put the final amen in Revelation 22. Uh, Satan has taken the Bible and put it right in his crosshairs. I mean, the greatest kingdoms, the greatest dictators, the world rulers, they had one thing that put them together, one thing they had in common. Go back a hundred years and you can pick your Hitlers, your Stalins, you can pick your Pol Pots or your Fidel Castros, you can pick your Mao Zedongs. It really doesn't matter what the name is. It doesn't matter where the empire was. But one by one, every Every one of those wicked dictators, every one of those murderous men, for all their different philosophies and all their different ideologies, you know they had one thing that tied them together. They all hated the Bible. And pick a Hitler, pick a Stalin, pick a Pol Pot, pick a Putin, you can pick a Castro, you can pick a Mao Zedong. Every single one of them, when they rose to power, they put the Bible in their crosshairs because they were of their father, the devil. They attacked the Word of God. The Bible would not be tolerated in the land. Why, the Word of God speaks liberty. Liberty doesn't work in a, a society like that. Look at our own country. Look at the assaults against the Word of God. There are people who literally run for office against the Bible. There are people that do everything they can to make sure there won't be a Bible in a class, there won't be a Bible in a schoolroom, there won't be a Bible in a courtroom. Why, the Bible's been laughed, the Bible's been maligned. In the public school system, from the time somebody's about that high, they grow up day after day, where teacher after teacher, and it really doesn't matter if it's history, it doesn't matter if it's English, it doesn't seem to matter if it's math class. Why, the one thing they do is laugh at the Bible. They attack the Word of God. They mock the Bible. When somebody goes to college, it's all more but even more the same. When they get to advanced training, why, the attack against the Word of God is incredible. In the U.S. military, I, in so many different places, jobs are lost because somebody actually believes the Bible. There has never been a book assaulted like the Word of God has been assaulted. I mean, the government takes our money and uses it to attack the Bible. This book has been ripped to shreds. This Bible has been mocked. This Bible has been ridiculed. This Bible has been inspected. You talk about the furnace of earth. This book has gone through the fires. It has faced the hottest coals of Satan itself. You would think that now the only place you'd ever find a Bible would be in the cellar of the Smithsonian. So... How are they doing with their attack against the Bible? No other book's been assaulted like this. You ever heard the Koran assaulted like that? No other book has been assaulted like the Bible. How's that working out? Two years ago, a lady did a study, and she wanted to go back 50 years and figure out the best-selling books. Now, remember the word best-selling. The best-selling book of the last 50 years. All right, she got them 10, 9, 8, 7, right down to number one. A a it's stunning. Number 10 on the list was The Diary of Anne Frank. There's other titles you might recognize. Number eight was Gone with the Wind. Number six was The Da Vinci Code. Uh, number four was Lord of the Rings. Number three was The Works of Harry Potter. Interesting, do you know the second bestseller of the last 50 years? This kind of surprised me. But the second bestseller was The Works of Mao Zedong, The Little Red Book. I, I was surprising. Then I remembered how many universities we have in America, so that makes sense. 
So follow now. You got number 10, the diary of Van Frank, 10987654322, right down to the works of Mao Zedong. Right, last 50 years, bestsellers, you add up 10 plus 9 plus 8 plus 7 plus 6 plus 5 plus 4 plus 3 plus 2. Add it all up, multiply it by 3, and then you would have the number of the number one bestseller of the last 50 years, which of course is the Bible. Now, whoever would have thought that? And by the way, could I remind you, those are the best sellers. I don't know the number, and I'm, I'm sure nobody does, but I suspect that for every Bible that somebody bought, there are 10 Bibles that are distributed for free. How could this be? How could you have an entire united world gathered together with the enemy being the Word of God? How could you have virtually every liberal university attack the Bible? How could it be that boys and girls grow up in a classroom where the Word of God is assaulted? How could it be that every time you turn on the TV, there is Hollywood mocking and laughing at the Bible? How could it be that this book is dragged into the hottest furnaces and the hottest coals of hell? How could it be that the Bible stands today because this book is tested and it comes through shining every time. There is no enemy that's going to conquer this book. There is no foe that's going to put this in the ground. There is no politician in Washington for all their arrogance and all their hubris. That is, when they are taking on the Bible, they are taking on Almighty God, the author of the Bible. And I don't care how famous they are. I don't care how wealthy they are. I don't care how big they think they are. When they take on Almighty God, one day they're going to grovel in the ground like the Hitlers and the Stalins do today, they're going to discover that at the end of the hour, it's the Word of God that lives and abides forever. So David says, when I get tired of the words of Facebook, he says, when I'm tired of hearing the fear of the media, David says, when I get sick and tired of all the flattery and all the phoniness, and, and when I'm tired of hearing people use their filthy gutter language, he said, let me just run to the Bible. The Word of God stands forever. The Bible is God's words. The Bible belongs to God. The Bible's pure. The Bible's precious. The Bible's tested. We love the next verse, verse number 7. The Bible is protected. That's what it means when God said, thou shalt keep them. God is going to guard his words. God is going to protect them. And now is he going to guard them? The Bible tells us he's going to preserve them. Because in verse 7, he said, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Thank you. That includes us. God said, I will make sure that every society has the the preserved words of God. Now, I know the seminary professor doesn't see that in verse number 7. I know the modern minister doesn't see that in verse number 7. But all you have to do is ask a, three, a, a third grader, what does it say? And you read it and say, God said he's going to preserve his words forever and ever. And I'm so grateful and so thankful that's exactly what he's done for you and for me. Yeah. David says, that's why I run to the Bible, because when I open up the Bible, I wasn't there in Genesis chapter 1, but God was. David can run to the Word of God, say, I wasn't standing with Moses in Exodus 32 when he said, who's on the Lord's side? But God was there. And David said, for all the talk of the world, when I can't take it anymore, he said, I just flee to my room. I open up the Bible. I I open up the Word of God, and for all the talk of the world, I know that Bible's going to take care of me. You know, before you get to verse number one, the Bible tells us Psalm 12 was to the chief musician. That would be their version of Brother Addison, the choir director. The Bible says it was to the chief musician upon the sheminith. A sheminith was a stringed instrument, but it was a huge instrument. had eight strings on it. In other words, Psalm 12 is so glorious. You know, most of the time when you read a psalm, they deliver it to the chief musician. David put an amen on there or a sila. He'd send it off to the chief musician and the choir had something new to sing the next week. But when it came to Psalm 12, God said, David, this isn't just for the choir to sing. He said, this is for the symphony to play. He said, next week when the choir congregates, next week I want the symphony there. I want the strings to play the introduction. I want the choir to lift up their voice in song. Make it a song of praise. Make it a song that is exalted. Lift up the noise to the heavens because in a world that is full of their talk and a world that is full of their language, the Bible tells us we have a book that rises above all of it. David ran to his Bible. So the question for you and me then tonight, how are we doing with our Bible? 
You know, it just might be the greatest sin in America, bigger than all the ones in Washington. It just might be the sin of people that walked home from church today, stuck the Bible on the shelf, and they're going to blow the dust off next Sunday morning and walk into church with a Bible. It just might be the grave sin of people who say, I'm glad Jesus could save me, but I can live my life without the Bible. Folks, I'm not going to make it without the Word of God. You and I are going to have battles we don't need to have without the Bible. That's why not a one of us can afford to leave the Bible on the shelf. That's why I love to hear a church say 66 books and 60 66 weeks, or 66 months, 66 years, whatever, 66 days. Whatever it is, that's a great thing. I, I mean, when it comes to the Bible, there's no bad way to do this. The Bible's kind of like going to Cold Stone Creamery, you know what I mean? You walk in there, oh yeah, it's all good. You want some of this? Oh yeah, that works. It's some of the, oh, there's no bad way to do this. There's no bad way to go to your Bible, but the only bad way is to let it sit on the shelf without a life that reads it and memorizes it and studies it. You can hear David say, for all the talk of the world, let me just get up tomorrow and run to my Bible. If David had to face that in his day, where it wasn't all the constant stuff you and I have, how are you and I going to make it without the Word of God? Hey, perhaps tonight we talk about revival and sing about revival. Maybe revival at Harvest Baptist Temple means God's people get a fresh heart for their Bible. How are you doing with your Bible tonight? If you don't know from the Bible that Christ is your Savior, in Psalm 119, the Bible says you need salvation according to God's words. In John, the Bible tells us that Jesus said, if you want to know how to go to heaven, fascinating now, he never said go to a minister and he never said go to church. He said, if you want to know how to go to heaven, search the scriptures, for these are they which testify of me. If you don't know from the Bible, you're going to heaven. Well, Brother Reed has nothing on the agenda tonight, nothing more important than having somebody sit down with you in an open Bible so you can read it for yourself. You can just see it for yourself, how a sinner like me can know that Jesus Christ is their Savior. And we don't need a church's word on it. We don't need our parents' word on it. We can have God's very word on it. Do you know from the Bible you're going to heaven? You know the Lord is your Savior. Then the question tonight from Psalm 12 is that if David's not going to make it in his day without the Bible, how do we think we're going to make it in our day without the Word of God? The answer to the world's talk, the words of the Lord. Father, I pray tonight you'd help Harvest Baptist Temple, help His people. Oh, Lord, how I pray that tonight you'd make us people that study the Bible and meditate on the Bible and love the Bible and, and hide it in our hearts. Oh, Father, may you raise up giant men and ladies of God who know their Bible and rest in the Word of God. Lord, for all the battles in this world, for all the fear that fills our society, for all the talk and all the language that goes back and forth, I pray you'd help us understand that as David did so many centuries ago, there is no hope unless we run to the Bible. I wonder before I finish praying if somebody here tonight would say, you know, preacher, I don't know that I'm going to heaven. I don't know that from the Bible. I would like Pastor Reed to have somebody open the Bible and show me from God's words how I can know that I'm going to heaven. What a glorious thing that is. You say, you know, I've never seen that. I don't understand that. We'd love to help you tonight, not from the word of a church or the word of a minister, but from the Bible. And so before I pray, I wonder if there's someone here tonight who would say, I want to know from the Bible how God said that I can go to heaven. I'd love to pray for you. We'd love to help you from God's word tonight. Would you just lift your hand and, and we'll see that hand. We'll pray for you tonight. I want to know from the Bible that Jesus is my Savior and I'm going to heaven. Is there somebody like that? I'd love to pray for you. If you let us, we'd love to help you right out of the Bible tonight. Salvation according to the Bible. Father in heaven, would you do your work in our hearts and lives? Oh, Lord, tonight in this place, would you stir your people for the Bible? Some Bibles on the shelves. Lord, I pray people be convicted tonight. I pray even at this altar, men, ladies, and young people would say, Lord, I need a revival of love for the Word of God. So we ask you to do a work that a preacher cannot do. In the great name of Jesus, I pray.
Would you stand with me prayerfully tonight? And at this altar, if you're not saved, we invite you to come and let us help you. If you'd say, Preacher, the Lord knows it and I know it. My Bible's been sitting on the shelf and I need revival of a love for the Word of God. What a great way to start a new year on our knees, saying back to the Bible, back to the Word of God. Oh, Lord, I need a revival of love for the Bible. So tonight, as Brother Addison sings and leads us, God deals in your heart. This altar is a great way to start a new year. Would you come? Can we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word? What a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still. And with all Same verse number two, would you come tonight? Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the sky, but his smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt or a fear, not a sign or a tear, and abide while we trust and obey. Trust and As we play that verse again and folks pray, how is it with you and your Bible? If we're going to spend more time watching TV than we are in the Word of God, this isn't going to work. And if we're spending more time on social media than we are in the Bible, then social media is going to win the day. If the talk of this world becomes the talk that dominates our thinking and our lives, then we're going to wind up as fearful and as rattled and as beaten down as this world is. But when somebody wakes up in the morning and instead of running to their TV, they run to their Bible and they say more wonderful words of life, sing them over again to me. Then for all the confusion and all the chaos, for all the fear, for all the rest of it, a child of God can be exactly where they ought to be above the mess that's called this world. And it's not going to happen unless our lives are saturated with the Bible. So we watch David look up to heaven and say, Lord, there's a crisis in my life and I can't make it. I need help right now. I am so tired with all the talk over the backyard fence. I'm so sick and tired of the flattery and the phoniness and the double talk and the loud talk and the dirty talk. So he said, Lord, what do I do? The next thing we see, David is unscrolling the wonderful words of life, the pure, perfect, preserved, eternal words of God. They've made it through the fire for the last 3,000 years since David's day, and this is the book that's going to take us home. But it's not going to get it done if in 2020 the Bible sits on the shelf. Preacher. Piano's going to continue to play. You have an opportunity to respond, but just a thought. If, if the people of this world only had one thing to go on, one thing to judge on whether or not you love the Lord, whether or not you were a genuinely believer, and that one thing was your relationship with God's Word, what conclusion would they come to? I mean, do you love God's Word the way that you ought to?
thank you so much for being in God's house tonight. And we've heard a message tonight that really will point us in the direction of the, of the revival. And that is when we go back to God's word. We got a people that engage the scripture. You remember um, the Berean Christians, they were commended because they searched daily whether those things were so. And, and what were they searching? They were searching out whether the preaching of the apostles' um, messages were so. And, and uh, man, we, we need to be those believers that will engage the scriptures, that will be in their Bible. And man, what a challenge that was. Are you in your Bible more than social media, more than you watch TV, more than you play video games? I mean, are you in your Bible? Man, if you, if you want to have a different year in 2020, be in your Bible. Be in your Bible. What a tremendous uh, message from God's Word. Thank you, Brother Swanky. Um, we're going to go ahead and be dismissed in a word of prayer. And again, if you have an opportunity, actually, we're not going to be dismissed in a word of prayer. Go and be seated, actually. <clears throat> thank you, gentlemen. You're going to thank them for this part. <laughs> um, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to take up a love offering before we uh, dismiss an order of prayer. And, and I want to thank you in advance for, for your generosity. Brother Schwenke is always a tremendous blessing to us. And, and so we want to take a, an opportunity to be a blessing to him also. And so I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward this time. And we're going to prepare to take up a love offering. Maybe you didn't come prepared tonight. Well, we're going to take up a love offering on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday also. But let's just do this. Make sure... Uh, on at least one of those nights, we put something substantial in just to be a blessing uh, to uh, Brother Schwanke and his, his wife as they've always been such a tremendous blessing to us. Let's have a word of prayer and ask the Lord to bless this offering. Our Father, again, we come before you just thanking you and praising you for the preaching of your word tonight. And Lord, what a challenge it's been to myself personally and no doubt to, to all of us how we need to engage the scriptures. Lord, how we just need to go back to the Bible. Oftentimes we find ourselves caught up in the cares of this world and worried about what's going to happen politically or in the Middle East. And Lord, as David took solace in your word, I pray that you'd help us to find refuge in the perfect, preserved, eternal words of the living God. Lord, as we take up this love offering, I pray that you'd help us to be a blessing to Brother Schwanky. And, and uh, Lord, he's a blessing to us all the time because he's faithful to preach your word. I pray that you'd help us to reciprocate and be a blessing to him. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let's stand together and we dismiss in a word of prayer. Let's make sure that we're back here tonight at 630 and have another wonderful service. Make sure you stop by the table and, and uh, take a look at the books and uh, purchase something. You can't get enough good literature into your homes. And so let's make sure that we take advantage of that uh, this week. Let's have prayer and we'll be dismissed. <clears throat> Our Father, again, we come before you thanking you and praising you for who you are. Lord, we're thanking you and praising you for what you've done in this place today. And Lord, uh, what you've done in our hearts. I pray that you would help us again to be students of your word, to engage the scriptures, to love your, your word, to, to memorize it, hide it in our hearts, to meditate upon it. Lord, I pray that you would help us to go to the only authority, which is your word. And uh, Lord, help us to be faithful to your word. We, we love you. We thank you for loving us. We look forward to the remaining nights of the meeting this week. In Jesus' name, amen.